I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome to On the Edge. Tell you what, let's go right to Sydney, Australia, and speak with Yanis Varoufakis. Yanis, welcome to On the Edge. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yanis, first, uh, tell me how much Greek government debt was there in total before the IMF loan, and how much is there now? Well, prior to May 2010, which was the first bailout package for Greece, uh, Greece owed roughly 300 billion euros. Uh, to its old creditors. At that point, it took on a new loan of 110 billion euros, of which two-thirds came from the European Union in various guises, and one-third from the International Monetary Fund. All right, so um, the current package that's being uh, rolled out to th the, this, w this, uh, this time, how does this uh, change the debt to GDP and other elements? Well... <laughs> The, the, the debt to GDP about a year ago was 130%. Uh, at the moment, it has climbed to 150%. Uh, my projection is that even, we, even after this uh, uh, haircut of around 20% that international creditors, excluding the IMF and the European Union, will be taking, uh, we are heading towards the 178, 180% mark. Uh, and rising, if my predictions come true regarding the sluggishness of the Greek economy, effectively the continuation and deepening of the recession. Now, let's talk about Germany for a second, because people in Germany are upset. They feel like they're underwriting the economy in Greece. However, because of the weakness in Greece, you have weakness in the euro, which helps the uh, export market of Germany. So what uh, exactly is Germany's game here? I noticed also that Deutsche Bank just reported fantastic earnings. And, of course, Deutsche Bank uh, is one of these predator banks that's in the business of gaming the system and seek and rent extraction from trafficking in derivatives and other uh, weapons of mass financial destruction. So how does Germany, are they a net winner or a net loser in this? I think the whole of the Eurozone, Surplus countries like Germany and deficit countries like Greece are definite losers in the whole game because the game uh, is it, not a zero-sum game. It's not that Greece's benefit is Germany's uh, loss. We have managed to concoct a game in which everybody is a loser at the moment. The irrationality of the European Z Union is going to go down in history as uh, an example for future generations to avoid. Uh, we have a situation where the German taxpayers are quite right to protest the way in which they are under, forced to underwrite, not the Greek economy, but bankers to, to whom uh, the Greek government owes uh, oceans of money, while all along, uh, both the Greek and the Dutch and the German and the Spanish taxpayers are standing to lose not only uh, in the form of rents, as you put it, that are being transferred to a bankrupt banking system, but the Eurozone banking system is bankrupt. Let's be completely honest about this. But I think the, 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 the great loss of political legitimacy, both in the north and the south of Europe, the surplus and the deficit regions, comes from the fact that uh, pol our political leaders uh, have been for 18 months now putting forward one plan after the other, supposedly for dealing with the crisis, and to do is fuel the crisis. Let me just add one last, last wrinkle in response to your point about Deutsche Bank and the rest of the Eurozone banks. Here we have a major conundrum. I call it the great European conundrum with regarding its banks. We have banks that make fabulous profits on a day-to-day -day -day basis, which is not very hard to understand, because if you're borrowing from the Euro European Central Bank at 1.25%, 1.5%, and you're lending at 7 8 10 15%, then it's very hard not to make money on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet, wh why is this a conundrum? Because if you're using banks, as I said, that are bankrupt. They're making very large profits, and they're insolvent at the same time. Go figure. Well, they're bankrupt to the extent that they've placed all of their liabilities onto the balance sheet of the ECB, similar to the United States. You have banks like J.P. Morgan that has a multi-trillion dollar balance sheet, but it doesn't sit on J.P. Morgan's books. It sits on the books of the Federal Reserve Bank. So J.P. Morgan simply is rent extraction or they're just like a croupier. They're just pulling up all of the, the, the losing bets that they, in fact, guarantee, and they make profits at the expense of the overall economy. Now, the banks, of course, are making out like gangbusters, and the banks now, in America anyway, they are up to 60% of GDP 
is tied to banks, banking activities. They've crowded out both the public and the private sector. So it seems like in the Eurozone, a similar model is emerging. Banks will become a much bigger part of the overall European-wide GDP going forward now that they've created a new multi-trillion dollar or multi-trillion euro lending facility. So can we just expect more banking terrorism, uh, bigger, better banking terrorism going forward pretty much? I don't disagree with your analysis of J.P. Morgan and what's ha ha happening in the, in the United States of America. But I, I would say, I would add that the situation in Europe is far worse and uh, more untenable than in the United States, if you can believe that. And the reason is that not only is it that the European, the Eurozone banks have uh, effectively, as you put it, quite correctly, a huge, huge liabilities with regard to not just the European Central Bank, the, the, but the system, the European system of central banks, which is not one of the same thing, but that's a technicality. Europe, Eurozone banks, unlike the, the, their United States counterparts, after the great financial disaster of 2008, well, they still have not been cleansed of all the toxic waste uh, that remains in their books. You see, in Europe, we never had TARP. We never had any uh, government-sponsored uh, uh, procedure by which to recapitalize the banks. So the banks, on the one hand, have huge liabilities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the, the central bank, and at the same time, they are replete with not only toxic waste derivatives, but also um, paper that has been issued by a large number of uh, uh, member states of the European Union, uh, which is of doubtful, doubtful uh, quality. Sure, but Yanis, uh, the purpose of this new lending facility that's being put in place is to create a new slush fund to bury all of that toxic debt. So they're yet to bury their toxic debt, whereas America has already buried their toxic debt and, and the banks in America are about to go through another behind America in terms of collapsing. And the, the European banks are just on the verge now of creating their TARP. There'll be a TARP-like bailout for Europe next year once they put this credit, credit facility in place. And the, the idea with Greece, it seems, is that they're trying to kick the can down the road until next year when they have everything in place to create a TARP and then uh, create a bailout for Greece under the rubric of this massive European-wide lending facility. And of course, in the case of the Eurozone, they do have Germany, which is the world's number one exporter, and it's a dynamic economy that's growing, whereas in America, there is no such um, entity that even comes close to Germany. There is no Germany in America. It's, it's across the board. For C to signing C of direct. There is no growth at all. Two points in response to your interesting point. Firstly, you're right. The EFSF, the European Financial Stability Fund, is being touted as a European top that will come into being next year. But don't forget that, that over the last three years, uh, it didn't exist. Uh, it was very late in coming in, in, into being. It hasn't still come into being. And these three years are three years during which European banks are operating like Japan's banks were in the 1990s. So they operate like black holes that have been absorbing liquidity and absorbing economic energy throughout the Eurozone. And three years is a very long time in the financial sector. The second point... Now, just let me, uh, let, me, let me cut in right there for a second. Well, three years at an off-balance sheet debt at 0% interest rate is a non-event. It doesn't exist. It's not on the books, and they don't pay any interest on that debt. It's part of that shadow banking system, of which there is 20 to $30 trillion in size. So they're just biding their time. So it's not, an econ it's not a hit to them. It's just an accounting entry. So I would oh, just... Oh, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's not just an accounting uh, matter. These banks, because they know that all this time that they re relied on the kindness, not of a federal Europe, but of... Uh, uh, then the national governments, which are bankrupt in many cases, those banks, to a very large extent, have been operating like black holes. They have not been lending to anyone all this time. Uh, the, the Eurozone is finding itself in a black hole of investment and of economic activity, much, much worse than what the United States have been. Going, uh, Looking forward to September and October, uh, Greece is to receive another 
IMF bailout. Talk, walk us through that. What do you, how do you see that working out? Well, this second bailout have, has been touted uh, for, for many months now because it was clear that the first one was insufficient, in, 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 not just in, insufficient, it was catastrophic. It was making a bad thing worse. So the second bailout has been on the cards. What hasn't been on the cards was that uh, as we are, were approaching the second bailout, Italy and Spain effectively fell through the cracks. And they had to come up with a major, major set of concessions uh, regarding interest rates and the prolongation of a rescheduling, a reprofiling of, of the Greek debt. The problem is this, that while the, the main three measures that they approved regarding Greece are quite sound, firstly, that there has to be a, a far more serious and comprehensive debt management. The second one is that banks have to be recapitalized, as you said before. And thirdly, that there has to be a Marshall Plan for, for Greece to stimulate growth. These three are quite sensible policy axes upon which to found uh, a new approach to Greece. The problem is that if you simply concentrate those three measures on Greece, letting the rest of the Eurozone as is, it's bound to fail. Because there is no way that you can have a Marshall Plan for, for Greece, uh, which simply reshuffles existing monies within the Eurozone. It would effectively mean that you have to take structural adjustment funds, investment funds away from Spain and Ireland to direct to Greece. Uh, this is, uh, from a Euro, Euro, Eurozone point of view, it's not going to solve the problem. It's sim simply going to reshuffle the problem. It's going to redistribute the lack of aggregate demand throughout the Eurozone. Similarly, the debt man uh, management that is being proposed for the failed states of Greece, Ireland and Portugal, well, you can't have it just for them when you have a huge amount of sovereign debt lingering in Spain, in Portugal, in Belgium, in Portugal, in Italy, in Belgium, but also in France. So effectively what they've done is they've uh, adopted principles that they ought to have adopted for the Eurozone as a whole, but only for Greece. And this is a major gift to speculators. Speculators now are going to have a field day betting that this uh, system is not going to work, that these three principles cannot be applied just to Greece, and they will have certain very specific targets. They will be betting against France retaining its AAA rating. They will be betting against Italy and, uh, Italy's and Spain's uh, debts, and they will be betting against Spanish and French banks. So effectively, uh, what Europe has bought with the second bailout plan for Greece is uh, a very short respite before the crisis gets worse. And until and unless our European leaders realize that this is a systemic problem that requires a systemic solution, which is Eurozone-wide, uh, I'm afraid that the Euro is doomed. Well, you talk about uh, this Marshall Plan, but it sounds more like a blitzkrieg. In other words, you've got one very powerful banking system and economy in Germany. They're bombarding Greece with derivatives and other weapons of mass financial destruction in an attempt to confiscate assets and wealth, property. The same thing you would do if you rolled a fleet of tanks in and took the assets as part of an expanding empire. Uh, you're doing it with financial weapons. So you've got a blitzkrieg coming out of Germany. They're invading Greece. They're invading Portugal. They're invading all parts of Europe. Now, how is this different than Germany 1939, 1940, except using financial weapons? How is it different? The German banks are reporting record profits. The German economy is booming. How is this different than what we saw in Germany in the last century? How is it different? In 1939, there was a rational, though disgusting, plan in play. Now, there is no rational plan. You make it sound as if this is all a plan by Germany. How can it not Greece be a plan when you have co countries like Greece going bankrupt Believe at me. the benefit of, of German me. banks? You're saying that this Believe. was accidental. It's the accidental empire, Steve. I, uh, what I am saying is not that, the, that this is not an accidental empire. What you have is a failure on part of Germany to recognize the parameters within, within which German capitalism is operating. They have had no clue that this crisis was coming. They have tried to use uh, sticky tape in order to uh, cover up huge emerging and widening fault lines. And the, uh, there's no doubt that you're right that assets are being effectively confiscated from places like Greece by German companies and by German interests. 
Uh, but I don't see this as part of a plan. I wish it was part of a plan because then there would be a rational plan behind. And if you have a rational plan, you can always oppose it by means of another rational response. Here, what we have is a, is a series of knee-jerk reactions. We have a, a series of ex highly expensive bailouts that were never foreseen, never planned for by Germany. And instead of uh, this confiscation being part of some master uh, in, in imperial plan on behalf of Berlin, what it is is just a little bit of loot that Mrs. Merkel is offering uh, Deutsche Telekom, Deutsche Bank, and, and various other German uh, companies and private interests in order to pacify them while she is trying to improvise a way out of a crisis which is systemic in Europe while she is denying that it is a systemic crisis. I'm afraid that uh, the situation in Europe is not just a, a, a 19th century imperial game between the strong and the weak. It is ma much more like uh, a coordination failure, a problem of European capitalisms, the way that they've bound each other to, to each other by means of a common currency to create some uh, uh, rational plan for making the whole thing that they've created, their creation, sustainable. Okay, so the Euro project, which was really started in Germany uh, at the Bundesbank uh, during a period when Germany was um, not allowed to reunify due to the constraints after World War II, uh, gave birth to the Euro uh, and gave birth to a reunified Germany. And 10 years later, due to instability caused primarily by Germany, the Eurozone is breaking up, with the result being a reunified Germany, possibly with their own currency and their own central bank and the most dynamic economy in the world. And that's just a series of coincidences and accidents. And we shouldn't read anything into that. OK, fine. I get your point. All but, right. But let's, hang uh, on a second. Hang on a second. <laughs> you can't get away with this so easily. <laughs> right. Germany is going to be in dire straits if the euro collapses and they have to reconstitute to their Deutschmark. They will lose the Chinese markets and then at the same time they will have lost the greatest source of aggregate demand for them, which is the rest of the eurozone, if the eurozone breaks up. This is not a rational plan. Germany, Germany is facing a decade of disaster the way it is proceeding at the moment. This is why I'm saying it's not part of a rational plan. Let me put it very simply. You gave a, a brief historical outline of how the creation of the euro. Let me add a very important factor that you missed out. The euro was created under the auspices of the United States of America. Be be between the mid-1970s and 2007-2008, the great financial disaster crisis, the United States of America had managed to create an unstable equilibrium internationally in which the world's surpluses were sustaining the twin deficits of the United States. Under that set of circumstances, the euro was sustainable. In 2008, the United States of America lost its capacity to absorb the surpluses of places like Germany, Japan and China. This is what has thrust the whole world into a global instability and what has made the euro incapable of surviving the way it was designed by the Bundesbank, as you put it, uh, prior to 2008. The great disaster of 2008 has changed the world. It has changed the United States. It has brought a new set of circumstances in the East with China and so on. And it has made the pre-2008 design for the euro unsustainable. If the European Union leadership of the surplus countries primarily do not manage to pull their, pull their act together and they go ahead the way you are suggesting, they are facing a major catastrophe in the next 10 years. Well, in 2008, of course, uh, in Europe, there was tremendous inter-European trade, which insulated themselves uh, tremendously from that crisis. And, and you mentioned the U.S. and the fact that the U.S. was... Um, in part orchestrating the creation of the euro. I mean, again, going back to the late 1930s, let's not forget that banks in the U.S. like J.P. Morgan were financing the uh, German Reich at that time, uh, as well as money into the allies. So they were playing both sides of the fence. So you can't, you can't look at the U.S. as being a separate entity with their own agenda. Again, you go back to the banks, that whether it's J.P. Morgan or Deutsche Bank, or uh, uh, banks in other locations around the world, they themselves, all these banks are colluding with each other to, to create this situation where they are um, floating trillions of dollars worth of debt, 
and creating austerity measures around the world. There's no, there's no, there are no countries anymore. There are only a handful of banks, and these banks are extracting huge rent from people around the world through austerity measures by creating trillions of dollars worth of debt that nobody's asked for. One, one last question. How do you create growth in the Eurozone? Well, it's very simple. What you, what, you, what you need to do, if you create a, a common bond, the equivalent of U.S. Treasury bills in, uh, the, in, in the Eurozone, Eurobonds, and you transfer a significant part of national debt to the center, financing it by means of this Eurobond, that way you shrink the debt with one very simple attempt to at, uh, at, at achieving continental consolidation, a bit like something like Roosevelt did in 1932 with uh, U.S. Treasury bills. At the same time, those very euro bonds could be used in order to part finance the European Investment Bank, which has the capacity to uh, carry out investment projects in Europe, in Europe that are four times the, the size, the volume of projects uh, affected throughout the world by the World Bank. That would be a very easy way of creating aggregate demand. The EFSF is not about uh, aggregate demand, the European TARP, that is. It's all about making sure that the banks uh, stop being completely in awe of uh, the impending uh, bankruptcy of uh, national governments. Imagine if in the United States, the state of New York had to bail out uh, Wall Street. And Wall Street was expected to be bailed out by the state of New York. Then Wall Street would be in panic in a way that Wall Street is not in, in panic now. Uh, so this is, this is what the EFSF is about. It's not about creating and stimulating aggregate demand. It's about creating a Europe-wide uh, system uh, of uh, supervising, but primarily recapitalizing the European banks. And to increase debt. And of course, in 1932, the U.S. was on a gold standard. Well, anyway, we only, we've run out of time. But um, uh, thanks so much, Yanis uh, Varoukfekis, for being on the edge. Thank you. It was very pleasurable. All righty, and that's going to do it for this edition of On the Edge with me, Max Kaiser, and my guest, economist, Yanis Varoufakis. If you want to send me an email, please do so at ontheedge at presstv.com. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.